Let's turn in our Bible tonight to um, 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. And we're going to break into the chapter at verse 18. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 18. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon, and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, and shut the door upon him, and went out. And she called unto her husband, and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men, and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God, and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Then she saddled an ass, and said to her servant, Drive! And go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Bahazai came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again. And lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them, and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him, and told him, saying, The child is not awaked. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead, and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up, and laid upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands, and he stretched himself upon the child. The flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 37. And we pray God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now, my text tonight is taken from 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 26. The question is asked, is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. And my subject this evening is the wellness of your soul. You see, this was a burning question that was put to the Shunammite woman. Once the man of God perceived that this Shunammite woman was riding her ass at speed, in his direction, he dispatched his servant, Gehazi, to run and meet her and asked this threefold question on his behalf. Is it well with thee? 
Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? Now notice her answer. This is what she said. It is well. And the word well here, if you look at the margin, literally means peace. The word well is the Hebrew word uh, shalom. And of course that has got a very rich meaning uh, and I will tell you about that a little later. Here's a question. Where do we go today to find peace in a very troubled world? Do we have the peace of God in our homes and in our hearts? And we need to be honest about that. This woman was asked the question, is it well with thee? In other words, are you in a state of peace? Do you know safety, certainty and enjoyment? And here was her answer. And there was trouble in this home, as we'll see in a moment. And here was her answer, it is well. There's three things that come to mind as I thought about the wellness of your soul. Notice the heartache experienced. Here's a woman and she's asked a direct question. Is it well with thee? Mention was made of her husband and the child. Now the reality was, as we have read together from verse 18 right through to verse 37, that her only son, her child that was born and weaned and grown, had died in the harvest time. Isn't that what we read in verse 20? Look at the book. And when he had taken him, that was the lad from the harvest field, and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon. And then died. Death had come and laid hands on her beloved son and taken him away. The cold hand of death. This was a day of trouble. This was a day of heartbreak. A time of loss. Could you imagine her grief? <clears throat> Doesn't Job 14 and 1 say, Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble as the sparks fly upward. Nahum the prophet, chapter 1 and verse 7, speaks of a day of trouble. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Knoweth them that trusteth in him. See, every one of us has a day of trouble. And there's times when it appears that our life is full of troubles. Now, one of our hymns in our hymn book that we're going to sing in closing tonight is hymn number 351. And it's the hymn, When peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And of course that hymn is based on the words of our text tonight. That hymn was written by a man called Horatio Gates Spafford. He was a lawyer from the city of Chicago in the United States of America. And he was a man who had three, maybe we could say four, big tragedies in his life. The first tragedy was in 1871, the great fire of Chicago, his business premises burnt to the ground. He had a good business, he was doing well, and he watched it go up in smoke. The legend is that the Great Fire of Chicago was started by a cow kicking over a lantern full of oil. It burnt for 16 hours. Three and a half square miles of the city of Chicago was destroyed. And many businesses, including Horatio Spafford's business. And it led to financial troubles. It led to, to worries. It led to insecurity. Put yourself in the man's shoes. Maybe you're here tonight and you're facing difficult times financially. You find it hard to make ends meet and you've got worries and stress because of it. And I want to ask the question, in the midst of your financial crisis, have you got treasure in heaven? Have you got unsearchable riches in the bank of glory? Do you know and love him? That's the peril of great price. Because treasure in heaven, riches in the bank of glory, the pearl of great price, cannot be taken away and can never be destroyed or lost. 
If you're saved tonight and know and love Christ as Lord and Redeemer, then be glad and rejoice that you've got a heavenly bank account. You've got riches galore that nothing can ever touch or destroy. Now, the financial crisis, of course, is topical because there's a financial crisis in our province at the moment uh, with the threat of the collapse of the Stormont Executive and the bringing down of the Stormont Assembly. And, of course, we're thinking about the financial crisis in Europe uh, with the worsening situation in the Greece situation. And we're wondering, is it going to uh, leave the euro or not? And, of course, maybe I should just add this bit. It's not a surprise, really, that we've got a crisis economically and financially in the province of Ulster. Because you've got people in the government that don't want the government to work. You've got people in government whose aim is to to wreck and destroy and bring down the legislative assembly. And financial stability is certainly not on their agenda. And of course, yes, we're all glad that violent terrorism may be over for many, but, but here's a new form of terrorism, economic terrorism. Men who've decided that if they don't get what they want, they threaten to pull the whole house down. And of course it causes God's people to mourn. But you know in the financial crisis, whatever happens in the storm at assembly, whatever happens in Greece, isn't it good to know that you have got real treasure in the bank of heaven? And the financial crisis, when it came to Horatio Spafford, he could say it's well. Notice his second tragedy. D.L. Moody was in England. There was a revival had broken out there. Thousands were getting saved. And Horatio Spafford decided he would go on holiday with his wife and his family. He had got four lovely little daughters and uh, he was going to see the man of God and he was going to holiday in England for a time and then over to France as well. Situation arose as he had started again a practicing law and the new premises, getting back in his feet. He just couldn't go immediately on the day that they were all set to seal off. So he sent his wife and his family ahead and he intended to catch up. Sadly, they're uh, if you think of him waving them goodbye, saying cheerio, kissing them, hugging them. But sadly, tragedy struck. Their ship uh, collided with another ship off Newfoundland. The ship, sadly, was going down very quickly. You know what Mrs. Stafford did, folks? She gathered her four little girls. Now, now think of this. There were three, there were five, there were seven, and there were age nine. Three, five, seven, and nine. Little steps of stairs. And she got them together and she prayed with them on the deck. And she asked, God, if it's your will, save these girls and me. Half an hour later, the ship went down. The four little girls went into the Atlantic. Icy waters. They were swept away. The wife was eventually rescued. She ended up in Cardiff and Wales. And she sent a message to her husband through telegram. Saved alone. Now, 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 what did Horatio Spafford do? Did he blame God? Did, did he get angry? Did, did he say, you know, I have enough of this saved business. Enough of this religious stuff. It's not worth serving God. It's, it's useless. No, he didn't think or say anything like that at all. Do you know what he did? He got on the next ship. And he was intending to go to the side of his wife. He wanted to comfort her. He wanted to be there with her, rightly so. So on the next vessel, he got the captain to tell him the exact spot of the accident off the coast of Newfoundland. He was told. And you know what he did after seeing the scene from the deck of the ship? He got into the, down into his cabin and he penned those lovely words. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It was in that situation he penned the words. Now, now let me ask this, Re- really, let's be honest. Could we have done that? He didn't question why 
or become bitter or downcast or depressed. He didn't question God, doubting his love, his care, his wisdom, his holiness. He, he didn't question God and say, look, I didn't deserve this, Lord. That's what he did. In his cabin, he penned that hymn, 351. You know the third tragedy? He was back in the U.S. with his wife, back in Chicago, and he had three more children, two girls and one son. And sadly, his boy died at the age of four. Now, now what problems? What tragedy in his life over a period of time? Yet in the midst of all these awful tragedies, he could say, as I've quoted, the words in verse 2, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come. He had, he had a share of them. He was a shining example of a man who had faith in God in adversity and who could say, it is well, the wellness of his soul. I have got peace, safety, certainty and enjoyment that nobody knows nothing about. Could I just tell you very quickly a fourth tragedy in his life? See, after all he had been through, the people in his church in Chicago began to question him. They began to murmur against him. Do you know what they said? All these tragedies come into Horatio's life because of sin in his life. That God was punishing him. I, I, I want to tell you, isn't that hard to take? Isn't that hard to believe that born-again Christians who claim to love Christ could be so callous against a brother in the Lord. It was, of course, stupid and sinful. Many in the congregation saying, these tragedies came about because of God's judgment, God's chastisement, God's punishing you for something you've done, some secret sin. I want to tell you tonight, they were wrong. And it would been far better if they'd have kept their mouth shut. And far better if they hadn't uh, 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 used slander and lies and given their verdict and their opinion that was not of God against the, the, the servant of God. Turn over there to John chapter 9. Remember the man that was born blind in John chapter 9, dealt with by the Saviour. And he was asked the question, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents, that he was born blind, John 9 and 2. Do, do you see that? Now, now think of it, this man was born blind, that's a disablement. And he was asked the question, who did sin? Was it him or his parents that he was born blind? In other words, the fact that this man was born blind is a form of judgment, punishment and chastisement upon him because of sin. Look at verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned. Now the man was a sinner. Nor his parents. But Jesus was saying that this man's affliction, disablement, was not as a result of sin. That was the point he was making. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. In other words, this was not a punishment for sin. And how foolish God's people can be. And how God's people can act in the flesh sometimes. And say things that are best left unsaid. Because this man was born that way. To the glory of God. That the works of God might be made manifest. And it's wrong to say someone with a dead child is suffering God's judgment or punishment. It's wrong to say someone born with a disabled child has born disabled because of the parent's sin. And it's God's punishment. It's wrong to accuse of sin. It's wrong to actually play God and pretend that you're wiser than God. It's sinful. It, it's said, I believe, without feeling. I, I believe it's said... Without respect. So, so here's Horatio Spafford. And he's facing all these tragedies. And maybe you're here tonight and you're facing 
trials and troubles, not of this kind. Maybe not financial difficulties, not, not the loss of children. But maybe you are facing bereavement, loss of loved ones. Maybe you're facing sickness, illness, fear, worries, troubles of one sort. Maybe it's coping with a, 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 someone who's sick at home. And here's the question. Is it well with thee? Do you have peace in your heart? There's the, the heartache that's experienced. Notice something else. There's an honest expression here. Remember how the woman answered, what did she say? It is well. Is it well with thee? She wasn't asked about her home life. She wasn't asked about the harvest. It wasn't really about her physical frame or even her health. It wasn't really about financial matters at all. Personally, I believe that the priority was when the question was asked, is it well with thee? It's primarily about spiritual matters. You see, the word well, as I've said, it's mentioned here four times. Four is the number of complete witness. God was witnessing tremendous truth. The word in the Hebrew is shalom, peace. It literally means safety, certainty and enjoyment. The question was being asked, are you safe? Have you got certainty in your soul and assurance? Do, do you know enjoyment? The joy of the Lord is thy strength. So when the question is asked, are you well? It has to do primarily with spirituality. And I asked that tonight in the meeting. You are here. Is it well with your soul spiritually? The wellness of your soul. That means that you've recognized your sinnership. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18 and 20, the soul that sinneth it shall die. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. There has to be a recognition, I've got a sin problem. The heart of life's problems is the problem of the heart. The heart is deceitful and above all things desperately wicked. And who can know it? And it's a hard thing to do, to admit that you're a sinner. That you've broken God's law. That, that you deserve wrath and punishment because of sin. But that's where true salvation starts. That's where true well-being in the soul starts. Recognize your sinnership. It also means repenting of your sin. Remember Jesus said, Luke 15, Except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He said it two times. And repentance means a turning from sin. It's being sorry enough to stop or sorry enough to quit. It's the soul's divorce. Let me give you a wee story. There's an open air meeting one time and there's a man who used to be a drunkard. Now his life has changed. He's been saved by the grace of God. And he's been asked to testify. And he's testifying away. And these few idiots come walking past. And they're dissenters and detractors from true religion. And they shout, hey, it's only a dream. You'll wake up. It's only an illusion. And as he said that, the sweet girl stepped forward and says to the man, Please, sir, if it's only a dream, don't wake him up. He's a new daddy to me now. His life has changed. And they could see the change. The people who were there in the open air meeting. Someone has said that sin and hell are married until repentance and redemption proclaims a divorce. Now what about you tonight? Has there been a change in your life? Because there was a time when you repented of your sin. You, you were sorry enough to stop your lifestyle. Have you been regenerated by the Spirit? That, that's another step. Remember Jesus said to Nicodemus, uh, Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. You've been born again by the Spirit of God. Alive to sin, the Savior, your soul. A, a, alive to salvation. Have you been redeemed by the Savior? What a glorious hymn it is to be able to sing, I am redeemed. Is that true of you? That you've been brought to the sight of Christ? That the blood has been applied all because you recognized your sin and repented and you've been regenerated by the Spirit and now you're turning to the Savior? Can you sing tonight, it is well with my soul? Have you got peace?
from God and with God. Do you know safety? If anything should happen. Could, could you imagine those people on the beach sunning themselves on holiday? We all go on holiday. We all enjoy it. And someone coming out of the water that you wouldn't expect with a, a, a gun and start shooting people dead. What if that had been you? Or me? Have we got the certainty? No matter what happens in life, for me, it's absent from the body and present with the Lord. And we can live in the enjoyment of that. Let me tell you another little story. There's a Belfast City missionary. And he used to tramp the streets of Belfast, speaking to souls and giving out tracts. And he invited this young girl sitting uh, in one of the streets in Belfast. Don't think it was Royal Avenue, one of the side streets, maybe Anne Street. And he said to her, love, I would like you to come and hear the gospel. I would like you to come to the church and hear words whereby you can be saved. And you, see, you know what she said? She said, I'm not becoming to your church. I want nothing to do with it. Clear off. And he turned to walk away. He was a gentleman. I wasn't going to force himself. And then he heard the wee voice Mr. Beatty, is that you? And he started to speak to the girl, found out that he had taught the wee girl in Sunday school, but she had got away from the things of God and she was now wandering in sin. And A few months later, uh, Mr. Beatty was in his house in Sandy Row and he got a knock on the door. There was a couple of wee women from Sandy Row, godly wee women, and they, they, they said to him, Mr. Beatty, would you come to the hospital? Martha's been admitted. He went to the hospital and he seen this young girl seriously ill. She had fallen into drink and guilty of prostitution and she was diseased in her body now. And you know, he had the joy in that hospital bed of leading that young girl, now somewhere in her thirties, to faith in Christ. And you see, we're not attempting in our community or in any church to get you to join the church. We're not trying to make you a free Presbyterian. We're not even saying to you, just start reading the Bible, but that's a good thing to do. We're not even saying to you, go and say prayers, although it's good to go to God and say, show me my sin. But we're inviting you to come to the Saviour. Because that's the only way you can be well spiritually. Notice the question was put to her first, is it well with thee? Before she could answer about her husband or her child, is it well with thee? Have you got well-being in your soul, woman? That was really the question. There was an honest expression she could say it as well. Finally. You'd be glad to hear that. It was not eight o'clock yet. There's a happy ending. You see, I want you to notice when she discovered the child was dead, notice what she did. She went to the right person. It says in verse 25, So she went and came unto the man of God. She was going to the Lord's prophet. Of course it was Elisha she, she was going to. She perceived him to be a holy man of God. And I want to say tonight, of course, that the greatest prophet of all is the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Matthew 21, This is Jesus the prophet. Of course, he's the son of God, but he's the prophet and he, he tells forth the truth. He, he tells and teaches the way of salvation. And the greatest prophet of all, by the way, is not Muhammad. I believe Muhammad to be a false prophet. And I make no apology for saying that. Now, I can't draw any cartoons. I won't attempt to do that. I won't deliberately insult people. But Muhammad's not the greatest prophet of all. Jesus Christ is. And I would just say to you tonight, if you're here and you've got a burden, you've got a tremendous need, you're facing a crisis, go to Christ. Tell him all about yourself and your problem. Because Christ is the answer. She goes to the right person. Notice, she goes to the right place. It says in verse 25, to Mount Carmel. Now, now why does she go to Mount Carmel? Did you know that Mount Carmel, and we discovered this when we were in Israel last year, that's the place of sacrifice. That was the place where Elisha and Elijah built the altar. And it was, of course, the place of the shed blood. It was the place where the fire fell. And, and of course, 
while we don't go to Mount Carmel, you can go to Mount Calvary. We were singing about that at the start because that's the ultimate place of sacrifice. That's the place where the fire of God's wrath fell. That's the place of the shed blood where Christ offered himself a, a once and for all sacrifice for sin. It's just gone to the right person. It's just gone to the right place. She gives the right proclamation which is asked, is it well with thee? What's her answer? It is well. There's confidence there. There's assurance there. You can be saved tonight and know it. This woman personally answers for herself and you can be asked the question, are you saved? And you can answer yes. And you can be asked the question, do you know that you're saved? And of course, the answer is yes. We believe, of course, and instantaneous salvation whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved but but listen to what John says there in first John chapter 5 and in the uh, verse um, 12 um, he, he tells us he that hath the son hath life and he that hath not the son of God hath not life these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. She gives the right proclamation. Can you give the right proclamation tonight? Because you know you've gone to the right person, the right place. It's well. And notice. She gets privileges. You know the wonderful thing is this. As the story ends. The man of God ends up coming back to her home. That's where the need is. There's a dead child in her home. And you know the glorious ending of the story? The child is raised again to newness of life. And I just want to close with this thought. You know what's one of the greatest privileges in the world to be a Christian? To know that you're a child of God. To have faith in Christ because there's tremendous benefits. And you know the benefits... There's a happy ending for the people of God. You see, Spafford and his wife are now in heaven, but when they got there, they were reunited with all their children, their four girls and their little boy who died at four. And that's true of all of us. The, the Bible tells us that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord uh, shall rise up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. There's a day of resurrection coming. There's a day of reunion coming. We'll see our loved ones again. Death is not the end. But only we have this privilege if we can say it is well with our soul. Are you looking for that happy ending? Because you've gone to the right person, the right place. You've gone with the right proclamation and you're looking for privileges. The privilege of being belonging to the household of faith.